Hi, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Emma Oakley. I am co-head of our real estate sector group in the London office of Taylor Wessing. I'm joined today by my colleague, Celine Fazal, who's head of our real estate disputes group and also the head of our Liverpool office, um, by Claire Harmon clark a senior professional support lawyer in our real estate group, by Amy Patterson, who is a partner in our restructuring and insolvency group. And last but not least, by Michael Yates, who is a senior associate in our IP and media group, who specializes amongst other things in reputation management. So today we're going to be taking you on a whistle stop tour of the impact that COVID-19 has had to date on the landlord and tenant relationship and talk to you about our views on what we think the longer term impact might be. And before we kick off, just a few housekeeping points. Um, hopefully everyone can hear and see us, but just to assure you that we can't hear or see you. So don't worry about putting yourself on mute or about any interruptions at your end. Um, that doesn't mean you can't communicate with us though. If you do have any questions for any of the speakers, then please do type them into the Q&A function, which should appear at the bottom of your screen. And we'll either pick those up at the end if there's time or otherwise one of the team will come back to you after the event. Um, for those of you who haven't already had a chance to uh, see it, please do head to our website for our recent report uh, entitled Impact of Coronavirus on the UK Real Estate Sector, Where Are We Now? We're going to be exploring some of the themes from that report in more detail today, but it also covers lots of other content which hopefully should be of some interest uh, to you. Um, and then finally, we've included a few polling questions for you to think about today while the speakers are presenting. The first one hopefully appearing on your screen now. And this one relates to the code of practice, uh, which Salim will be talking to you about in more detail in a moment. Um, and our question is how likely the audience thinks that code is to impact on how landlords and tenants approach potential disputes in practice. And the options we've given there are very likely, somewhat likely, or not likely. So while you all have a think on that, um, I'll ask Salim to kick things off. Um, Salim, could you possibly please bring us up to speed on what landlord and tenant measures have been introduced by the government to date? Sure, Emma. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Um, so there, there are four main areas which I wanted to cover, which relate specifically to the landlord and tenant relationships. Um, I'm sure that you will have heard of some of them before, but I'll, I'll, I'll cover them all in, in, in some detail, if I may. Um, the first one relates to the right to forfeit a commercial lease. So most uh, if not all commercial leases, will have an express right to forfeit for, for breach of the lease. And, and, and the one um, that we're covering today is non-payment of rent, because that's obviously the, the likely outcome as a result of the coronavirus and its impact. So the, the right to forfeit normally rises 14 or 21 days after the rent payment date, which is usually the quarter date. Uh, and that, uh, that the actual period does depend on, on what the lease says. Now, the important thing to, to recognise is that you can forfeit a commercial lease both by physically re-entering, that's known as peaceful re-entry, uh, into the property, or uh, by issuing court proceedings. If you, if you adopt the former approach, it does, of course, create an immediate possession entitlement on the part of the landlord. So it can be quite a draconian remedy. So what the government did um, on the 23rd of March after lockdown was announced was to create a moratorium over the landlord's right to exercise forfeiture. So from that date, commercial landlords of business leases were deprived of their normal right to terminate leases. That initially uh, extended to the 30th of June, um, but has now been extended to the 30th of September. So that means that, in effect, tenants were allowed the right to not pay their rent for both the March quarter date and, and the June quarter date, which falls on the, uh, fell on the 24th of June. So what happens next? Well, that date is capable of being extended further 
And as, as the right to forfeit arises 14 or 21 days afterwards, it doesn't yet impact on the next court date, which is the 29th of September. So it may very well be that if that date isn't extended, some landlords may take the uh, decision to forfeit the leases by peaceful re-entry on around the 13th or, or 20th of October, depending on what the lease says. So it's a question of watching this space. Um, will landlords do so? We can perhaps cover that, cover that later. Um, but it's fully expected that, that if matters have not improved substantially, that that date may be extended further. The second measure the, land, uh, the government introduced um, is in connection with um, CRAL, which is Commercial um, Rental Rears Recovery. It used to be uh, known as levying distress when bailiffs were appointed to go into tenants' premises and seize their goods um, unless they were paid. Um, still happens today, uh, and it used to be um, exercisable following seven days of non-payment of rent. Uh, when the uh, government first intervened, it was, uh, it, uh, the right was postponed for a period of 90 days, so there had to be 90 days unpaid rent instead of seven days. Um, it's now 189 days, so more or less six months' rent has to be outstanding. Um, I mean, it's quite, it's quite uh, uh, interesting when I was speaking to a few bailiffs about this, and um, it's pretty unlikely there'd be much in the premises anyway for... Uh, um, then to take. So it's probably not that surprising. Um, the third I wanted to touch on, uh, uh, the third measure is actually in relation to residential uh, tenancies, um, which are important for mixed-use properties. Uh, the, pr the previous prov provisions in respect of assured shorthold tenancies um, allowed a landlord to serve a notice providing two weeks notice if there were unpaid arrears in, 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 in certain circumstances. The government has increased that period to three months. So uh, there has to be three months notice given to any tenants uh, who are not paying their rent before they can issue court proceedings. Not only that, any possession proceedings that were in uh, in, in the process of going through the courts um, in March uh, this year, and any and, and in respect of any further possession proceedings to be issued, all of them will be stayed, i.e. no actions will be taken by the court until the 23rd of August. So essentially, there's a complete stay of anything, of any enforcement uh, against residential tenants um, until the 23rd of August. And, and it's widely thought that that date will be extended as well. And then the fourth um, measure, uh, which Emma mentioned in her introduction, was is the Code of Practice for Commercial Property Relationships during the COVID-19 pandemic, published on the 19th of June. Very snappy title. This, this um, covers the whole of the UK, and it applies to all commercial leases held by businesses which have been ser seriously or negatively impacted by COVID-19. Now, I said that it applies to all sectors, but it does actually say within the code that it's very likely that, that the sectors that will most be relevant to it are the hospitality, leisure and parts of the retail sector. And we all know why. Now, this um, code is entirely voluntary. But what it does do is set out what it considers to be best practice for landlords and tenants to follow. Essentially, the principles are these. The tenants are encouraged to pay the rent if they can afford to do so. And landlords are encouraged to support their tenants' businesses if they are able to do so. And that, of course, involves them engaging with their lenders to see whether uh, they, they themselves can be uh, provided some comfort on their existing financial arrangements. The overriding principle is that landlords and tenants should act transparently, swiftly, reasonably, and in good faith. Tenants seeking concessions are encouraged to share their financial information with their landlords, including their business plans for recovery. And landlords are encouraged to provide concessions when they can do so. And if they cannot provide any concessions, then they are encouraged to explain the reasons why not. So it's not a question of just saying, uh, no. Well, having said that, as I said, it's entirely voluntary, so it remains to be seen what happens.
So the possible solutions set out by the code are, are not surprising and, and ones which uh, we'll all have seen before, partial uh, deferral, partial waivers, full deferrals, um, extending the leases in return for uh, a, a higher payment to rent at a later stage, all of the, co uh, the, the configurations that we're used to. It takes a slightly different approach on service charges on the basis that, as it states, uh, service charges are payable uh, in order to, to maintain a building and are not intended to be profit making. So its starting point is to say that whatever the circumstances, tenants should really pay their service charges. However, it does go on to say that where property management costs are reduced as a result of the lockdown, for example, um, utilities may not be uh, uh, being used as much as before, or, or even uh, reception staff, then landlords should look to uh, see whether they can reduce the on-account payments uh, and, and rather than waiting until the end of the service charge year. But it also recognises, quite rightly, that landlords are having to expend more money on making sure that their buildings are are compliant for the return to the office, i.e. all the signage, uh, facilities uh, for, for social distancing. So it, it, it is a question of, 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 of a careful balancing act. Well, I hope that's given you um, some guidance on what the code says. So you might now be in a position to uh, vote on the first polling question. And on that note, I'll hand you back to Emma. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Celine. That was really helpful. I'll give everyone just a couple more moments to uh, cast their vote on that first question uh, and quickly go to Amy. Um, because although uh, the measures aren't landlord and tenant specific, Amy, there have also been um, some recent uh, corporate insolvency measures that have been introduced that impact on the landlord and tenant relationship also. So could you briefly take us through what those are? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Emma, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so back in April, the government announced that it was going to introduce measures to effectively protect the UK high street from aggressive rent collection. Um, and so at that point, it did sound like these measures were going to relate primarily to the landlord and tenant relationship, um, possibly just in the consumer and retail sectors. But then actually, when we saw the draft legislation, um, it was clear that those restrictions were actually going to apply much more broadly. And so now what we have as a result of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, which came into force um, on the 26th of June, so a few weeks ago, um, are a few things. So firstly, we have um, an absolute prohibition on any creditor, which would include a landlord, being able to present a winding up petition against a debtor company in respect of a statutory demand. Um, and we have a second prohibition on any creditor. Again, that would include landlords being able to present a winding up petition on the basis of insolvency. So cash flow or balance sheet insolvency, where that insolvency is a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, both of those restrictions apply until the 30th of September. So they align with the current moratorium on forfeiture that Celine was just mentioning. Um, and they both also apply retrospectively, uh, which was slightly controversial during the legislative process. But in respect of statutory demands, there is effectively um, now a, a prohibition on relying on any statutory demand that was served after the 1st of March. And um, in respect of the COVID-19 restrictions on winding up petitions, they apply to any petition presented on or after the 27th of April. Um, I should just note that it isn't an absolute prohibition. So landlords are still able to present winding up petitions on the basis of insolvency, but only where they can demonstrate that that insolvency has not arisen as a result of COVID-19. So just from an evidential perspective, that's going to be more difficult. Um, obviously, landlords are, are used to, when, when they need to, being able to serve statutory demands, waiting that 21-day period, and then having effectively a deemed insolvency that they can rely on. And that's now fallen away. So there will need to be kind of actively showing that insolvency uh, existed prior, prior to lockdown. Um, that said, it's not impossible, and uh, we are looking at it for uh, a couple of clients at the moment. It's just a more, more difficult process. The other point to flag 
from the new legislation um, is the introduction of a standalone moratorium. So this is a totally new process that's been introduced into the UK insolvency regime. It is effectively a debtor in possession process. So the company that takes the benefit of it, the directors will remain in control of the company, but they will have the protection um, of a statute or moratorium to prevent any creditors, including landlords, taking steps against the company whilst that moratorium is ongoing. Um, it's introduced um, primarily to facilitate corporate rescue. So the idea is that the stay will be in place in order for the company to restructure or to agree a refinancing. Um, it's, it's initially quite a short term moratorium. So it's 20 to 40 business days um, and it will be effectively supervised by a monitor, by a, a licensed insolvency practitioner. And they will need to confirm that in their view, it is likely that the moratorium will result in the company being rescued as a going concern. From a, a landlord and tenant perspective, um, obviously the, the tenant entity, assuming that's the company that gets the benefit of the moratorium, gets that breathing space to enable them to, to implement some form of, of corporate turnaround. From the landlord perspective, um, they will be unable to forfeit leases. So even if the, the moratorium on forfeiture, which Salim just discussed, does fall away on the 30th of September, if the tenant company nevertheless then takes advantage of the, of the standalone moratorium, that restriction will effectively stay in place. And it will also mean that landlords aren't able to take any other steps to recover any rent arrears due at the, at the time that the moratorium is triggered. Um, it's not all bad news. So uh, rent is treated as a moratorium debt. So rent that falls due during the period of the moratorium will need to be paid. And if it isn't paid, uh, the moratorium will be brought to an end. And, and I guess also just taking a step back, the, the idea of the moratorium is to facilitate corporate rescue. So on the face of it, we would hope that the company emerging from the moratorium is in a better financial position than it was going into the moratorium, which should, um, when all is said and done, be of benefit for creditors in the long term. Um, but that said, there is there's no getting away from the fact that whilst that moratorium is in place, it, it does significantly restrict um, landlords' rights. That's great. Thanks so much for that, Amy. And one thought that occurs to me there is thinking about that evidential burden on landlords in the context of stat demands and winding up petitions. If tenants are complying properly with the code of practice in terms of providing information, um, then the landlord might well be able to get that financial information that it needs um, in order to uh, confirm that there is an actual insolvency. Of course, in that dynamic, uh, the tenant's doing something which is actively not in its interest, and I suppose that might well be a scenario where, where the tenant wouldn't be minded to, to comply with the code in, in full. Um, I, but that, I think that's, an, I think that's an interesting. I think that's an interesting interplay actually, because at, at the moment um, landlords are are having to look to the last filed accounts, for example, at company's house. Obviously, if they have more recent financial information available, uh, that may help their position in terms of evidencing uh, pre-existing insolvency. But as you say, that might not necessarily be, be in the best interest of the tenant company at that point. So I think there will be uh, an interesting tension between those two. Thanks, Amy. So that probably brings us neatly on to the results of the first polling question. Um, OK, that's interesting. So almost 50 percent there are saying somewhat likely, uh, very likely just over 27 percent and not likely at 25 percent. So a bit of a mix of views there. Um, and Cillian, perhaps this is a good point to come back to you uh, just to talk in a bit more detail about what your views are on the package of measures that's been introduced to date um, and what sorts of issues they throw up from the landlord and tenant perspective. Yes, thank you, Emma. Um, and indeed, you, you, you quite rightly raised one of them, and that is, that's about sharing information. But let, let's go take them in the order that, that I presented them. Um, but look, the forfeiture on, on the moratorium on forfeiture and the uh, and the breathing space given given to residential tenants what must have been welcome to to, to preserve uh, rights of occupation. And, and remember, I, I mentioned residential tenants is not just for mixed use. Uh, buildings, but also for employees, those companies where where, where they've had to furlough staff or, or indeed take more drastic measures. Um, it, it, it meant that a lot of individuals were not thrown out onto the street. So um, I, I think that that's, that was positively and well received by, by tenants all, all around. Um, 
with commercial tenants and the suppliers of residential tenants as well, m many of them did not pay um, their, their March and, and June quarters rents, as we know, um, particularly in the sectors where the code code says that, they, that they're concentrating on. And this is essentially mounting debt, and, and it's difficult to see um, how that debt can just be written off um, across the board uh, in, in the commercial property industry. And ultimately, there, there will come a time when, when these interventions come to an end. They have to come to an end. Uh, and it, it must be a worry for tenants uh, that, that, that these debts will still be there to be paid. Um, yes, they can rely on the code, um, but um, echoing a point uh, that was just made, uh, will they want to share their financial information with their landlords? Uh, apart from um, any issues relating to insolvency, uh, there's also the question of their commercially sensitive business plans. Uh, and not many I know will want to um, share those um, for fear of, of their competitors um, becoming aware of what their, their plans are over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, Landlords need to be uh, creative and think about how they can have some skin in the game. Um, are they willing to take uh, some um, some equity uh, guarantees uh, on dependence on turnover? Um, are we going to have more turnover rent provisions for, for, for a, a temporary period while, whilst they, uh, they they see whether their tenants can recover? But, but those arrangements do require. Uh, significant financial analysis, and, and, and I can see a real issue there with tenants wanting to, to share them. But landlords have to think about something. They're coming under pressure from lenders. Um, they, they also have to um, have something to base their decisions on. Um, landlords of, 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 of the portfolio of properties, particularly shopping centres, office buildings, have to avoid the domino effect, so one particular tenant uh, in a building may require more help than another, uh, and that may help balance their own, uh, the landlord's own financial commitments. Uh, but once uh, a tenant discovers that, 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 that another tenant is being, being, being given a concession, then they will want one too. Uh, and so how do you um, retain that goodwill and trust and, 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 not, and not, not one of mistrust or, or, or feeling that they've been treated differently to, to, to another business in the, in the same building? Uh, and so it's putting property management skills to the test, it seems to me, and, and um, uh, in very difficult situations for all the parties. I mean, ultimately, we all know the code lacks teeth. Um, remains to be interesting to hear that, that poll result. Uh, let's see what happens uh, in terms of what, how, it, how it operates in practice. Thanks for that, Salim. Um, so let's move on to the second polling question. Um, and this is whether governments should be legislating in relation to the non-payment of rent on a longer term uh, basis, which is something I'm going to ask uh, Claire to speak on in a moment. Uh, so the options here are yes in all sectors, uh, B, yes, but in some sectors only, and C, no. Um, so Claire, while, while the audience gets a chance to give that some thought, could you possibly share with us your views on uh, whether the government should be legislating in the longer term beyond the measures that have already been introduced? Absolutely. Thanks, Anna, and hello, everyone. Um, of course, legislating for the coronavirus fallout is much easier said than done, not least when you consider the massive disparity with which the virus is hitting all these different sectors, as, as Salim has already alluded to. Um, hospitality, uh, leisure and retail have absolutely been the hardest hit. We've seen some significant scalps like Debenhams, Law Ashley, Oasis, Warehouse, they've all filed for administration. Um, Travel Lodge is currently under a CVA. Um, food, retail, and logistics have flourished better slightly as long as um, they face their well, they face their own virus challenges and come through. Business models have had to transform as shoppers have become concerned with um, hyper accessibility with, when the virus hit and lockdown occurred. There were supply chain problems as demand spiked and normal bricks and mortar sales and restaurant takeaways and purchases went online. But still, businesses that are fully tech enabled with flexible logistics strategies have fared best. Um, so maybe we do need a more sectorised approach. Now, as Salim has already discussed, legislation for our commercial property world to date amounts effectively to a controlled stop on forfeiting for non-payment of rent. 
However, where tenants have taken advantage of that forfeiture moratorium, there are genuine concerns coming about that cliff edge facing on the 30th September. Um, it's interesting just to compare for a moment to Germany, another country which enacted a very similar lease termination moratorium. Um, the German legislator has actually already called a stop to that. They've ceased the protection. The difference there, though, is that Germany's original law effectively came in with um, built-in repayment timetables, deferring that rent that was unpaid for a maximum of two years. Now, many of us have long thought that the obvious next step for the UK government is to set out its own repayment timetable for all that missing rent. Otherwise, of course, there's a real risk that those businesses will fall when the rug is pulled on the 1st of October. Um, but to be fair, we have a strong jurisdictional reliance on the sanctity of contract. Um, for example, we have no statutory implied uh, notion of force majeure to bring a contract to an end, um, and very little scope in the real estate world to argue that our obligations have ceased thanks to the common law doctrine of frustration. Um, but the approach of the government to date does seem decidedly laissez-faire, and landlords and tenants have been rather left to sort it out between themselves. So yes, I think they, hopefully there will be some legislation, but we wait, we wait and see. Thanks for that, Claire. So moment of truth, let's see to what extent the audience agrees with you there. Um, okay, so we've got just under 10% yes in all sectors, uh, yes, but some sectors only, uh, around the 57% mark, and then no, 33%. Uh, so yeah, um, the audience seeming to think that legislation is more appropriate in, in those sectors, presumably which, which have been the worst affected, like retail and hospitality. Um, so, Michael, at, at this point in time, it would be really great to bring you into the discussion because what's clear from what the other speakers have said so far is that landlords and tenants are going to continue to have some, some really bit difficult business decisions to make uh, over the next few months, as, as they already have to date. Um, so, could you talk us through some of the reputational risks that all businesses need to be keeping at the back of their minds when, when making these kinds of decisions? Of course, Emma. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think the current trend in these COVID times is to be nice. Um, so just as the uh, legislation, the guidance is very pro-tenant, I think the media narrative will be against any kind of debt collectors, including landlords. And that's despite the advantages uh, of the forfeiture moratorium or the reality that some landlords will not be able to absorb non-payment. Um, I think there are a number of other factors that landlord or, landlords or indeed any debt collectors should be aware of. Um, it's easy for the media to write a story um, about a landlord acting aggressively, and that will unfortunately be the default position <clears throat> unless, uh, you, unless it can be explained otherwise. I think some tenants who run um, popular brands um, with powerful social media channels uh, and very strong press connections will be able to make adverse noise um, if there is a dispute. Um, tenants will have employees, um, potentially a large number of employees who could be affected um, by, by uh, difficult decisions made by landlords. And all of those employees will have social media accounts um, and often collective social media uh, noise can attract media attention, so it's another way for allegations or stories to make their way into the media. I think the other point is that any court proceedings will take place in the public domain, and that will mean that, um, as, as is the case in all court proceedings, the media will be able to report what takes place under the protection of privilege. So if uh, the very damaging allegations are fired in both directions, then the media will be able to report on those without any concern of liability for publishing defamatory uh, allegations. And I think in the current climate, corporate actions are really under the microscope um, and are magnified by you know, the, the very anxious public perception um, at the moment in the court of public opinion. Um, and, and ultimately, adverse press could affect uh, the views of shareholders and investors um, across the board in any business. So I think it's a treacherous landscape for any debt collector at the moment, including landlords. And I think um, you need to go into the situation with your eyes open that you may be fighting um, not only a legal battle, but also a PR battle. Um, and you need to be alive to that fact and get ahead of the story and prepare on a communications front what you're intending to do on a legal front 
to try uh, and and dispel any adverse any adverse media. Great, thanks for that, Michael. And, and I'll come back to you in just a moment, if I may, to, to hear a bit more of your insight as no to how you can uh, prepare and, and defend against those adverse media stories. Um, but Amy, on that topic, clearly there's already been a lot of press around CBAs, particularly in the hospitality and uh, retail sectors. Um, could you talk to us um, in, in relation to what a CBA can achieve uh, from a landlord and tenant perspective uh, and why so many operators are, are considering going down that route in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So you're right. I mean, there's definitely been a continuation in the popularity of the CBA, the company voluntary arrangement as a restructuring tool, specifically as well, these landlord focused or landlord only CBAs in, as you say, sectors um, such as retail or casual dining or, or really anywhere where a company has a significant leasehold portfolio that it needs to rationalize or that it needs to restructure in order for that company to remain viable. Um, Claire mentioned Travel Lodge um, as a good example in recent weeks. We've also seen the restaurant group, which owns Frankie and Benny's and Wagamama. Uh, there's been Pound Stretcher, All Saint. A lot of, of companies out there with these sizable leasehold portfolios have proposed and had CVAs approved. And I don't think we're going to see a drop off in that trend given the, the economic ramifications of, of COVID-19. Um, it, in terms of what a CVA is, it's really just a compromise between a company and its unsecured creditors, um, but, but in you know surrounded by statutory provisions. And um, the, the big advantage from the company perspective, the company that's the proposing the CVA, is that if you can get 75% of your unsecured creditors to support that proposal, then that will bind the dissenting minority. So that's clearly advantageous over just normal bilateral negotiations where effectively you need to get everybody on board in order for that compromise to be binding. Um, in, in terms of how they work in the landlord-specific CBA um, arena, what, what a company will tend to do is they will look at their overall um, leasehold portfolio and they will categorise their leases depending on the financial performance of those sites and the importance of those leases um, for the business going forward. And that will then dictate the level of compromise that is applied to each of those categories. Um, and I should say that in statute, there's very little restriction on what can be proposed. It's very much left to the discretion of the directors to um, put forward their proposals to their creditors. But we have seen um, that certain characteristics and typical features that, that are now effectively market standard in a kind of in a landlord only uh, CVA context. So um, we will almost always see uh, rent being moved from quarterly to monthly. Uh, we will then see a rent reduction and um, that will apply on a sliding scale. So for your category A leases, which will be the kind of the ones that are performing well or the ones that are key to the business going forward, there might just be a very limited reduction of rent or, or perhaps no reduction of rent at all for those. And then you work along your scale down to your maybe category D, E or F leases, and you will see a much more significant uh, reduction in rent there, possibly down to zero. Um, rent arrears will also be dealt with in the CVA. Often they will be paid, but they may well be deferred. So it might be that rent arrears aren't, aren't paid for a number of months or possibly even a number of years. Um, Dilapidations will also be compromised and generally the approach is taken um, to apply a notional dilapidations uh, figure per square foot. So that will be calculated on a lease by lease basis. And, and we're also seeing CVAs being used um, in order to shift leases to market, uh, to turnover rent provisions rather, uh, which is something that, that's come about more recently. You'll also tend to see various provisions that are included in there to try and mitigate the risk of landlords challenging those CVAs as unfairly prejudicial, which is uh, one of the landlord's rights, and, and I'll just touch on that in a moment. And those type of provisions tend to be um, giving the landlord break rights, um, either on a rolling basis, if you're kind of in the category E or F um, uh, categorization, um, or perhaps just periodically through the term of the CVA. 
We've also, you'll also generally see the creation of a compromised creditor fund. So that will just be a pot of money that's set aside that landlords share in to ensure that they get effectively a better return out of the CBA than they would if the company went into administration. And then again, more and more frequently, we are seeing um, a profit share fund. So the idea being that compromised landlords, whilst they're taking the pain now, um, would be able to share in any upside if the CVA is approved and it's successfully implemented and the company um, returns to profitability. There are um, a couple of things that CVAs can't do. Uh, so I mentioned that there isn't much in terms of uh, prescription within statute, which is right, but there have been challenges before the courts and, and that's given rise to, to certain um, court decisions that means that, that now land, um, companies have to propose CBAs in certain ways. So a CBA cannot restrict a landlord's right to forfeiture, um, which is obviously helpful for landlords. And um, they also can't remove a landlord's right to pursue a guarantee. Um, from a company within the group, unless that guarantor entity itself is proposing a CVA um, or if there is adequate financial compensation. So what you will tend to see is if you um, are the landlord of a lease that has a guarantee from a, an entity that has a particularly strong financial covenant, you will generally be categorized as an A lease and your lease won't be particularly impacted. Um, otherwise, the company is leaving itself kind of wide open for um, an unfair prejudice challenge. Uh, in terms of the benefits of CVAs, kind of from the, the tenant and landlord perspective, I mean, it's probably fairly obvious from the, from the tenant perspective, they get the benefit of the revised lease terms. Um, a CVA is another debtor in possession type process. So management stay in control of the company, um, albeit the implementation of the CVA is um, overseen by a supervisor, again, a licensed insolvency practitioner. And they, and they also avoid the potentially terminal and, and um, perhaps, you know, kind of more adversely um, perceived proceedings such as administration or liquidation. From the landlord perspective, uh, maybe a little bit more difficult to see the upside to a CVA, certainly if you are in that kind of D, E or F category and the compromise that's being imposed on you is fairly significant. Um, I think the real question for landlords is, you know, is this CVA a better outcome than if my tenant went into administration? And I mentioned that they are generally structured to ensure that landlords will get more than they would otherwise have got on a hypothetical administration. And you, you're never going to really know if that's right or not, because obviously the company isn't going into administration, but some quite careful financial analysis is done around that to try and ensure that, that landlords are, are compensated um, adequately. Um, and, you know, with, with administration, it, it's a bit more of an uncertainty that the administrators might just try and hand the keys back to the landlords, um, or you might get a buyer that wants to take an assignment of the lease, but, but that's more of an unknown, whereas with a CVA, you, you at least know what your uh, financial position looks like. Great, thanks for that overview, Amy. That was really helpful. Um, Salim, just coming back to you uh, for a moment, we've been quite focused so far on non-payment of rent uh, by tenants because I think that's really what, what everyone in the industry has been preoccupied with. Uh, but clearly, coronavirus uh, does give rise to scope for other disputes between landlords and tenants, um, a, a number of which you've been advising on uh, so far to date. Um, could you just share with us your experiences with the other types of disputes that you've been seeing and will expect to see more of over the next few months? Sure. Um, the, the, the first one which um, uh, emerged, the first type of dispute, was, was the um, rent, sus rent suspension claim. So most leases have provisions that provide for the suspension of the payment of rent um, when, the, uh, when there is an event which prevents the tenant from occupying. Uh, and normally, you, you and, and what they're well, originally drafted to, to cover were, were, were hurricanes, storms, or explosions, or, or something of that nature. And so, if, if a tenant couldn't physically occupy, uh, rent was suspended, and there'd be an insurance claim, and, 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 and um, everything would be recovered in that way. Um, now, some of those have been drafted in a way that they could, in fact, cover the, the lockdown scenario that, that, that we're looking at. Um, because of the intention of those clauses tend to be around physical destruction, um, they are 
fairly few of those that, that could apply, but but it is worth looking at leases to see whether whether that 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 is something which a tenant could argue. Obviously, a landlord um, would need to then look at its insurance policy, and we're advising on many of those claims as well. Uh, and what we're saying to landlords in, in this situation is, in, in the very least, just in case there are some notice provisions for making an insurance claim, they should be notifying their insurers just to protect their position in, in the interim. Um, the, the next category is, is something which we saw after the Brexit referendum, and, and that is valuation difficulties. Uh, so the referendum was on the 23rd of uh, June, and, and the 24th of June was the, the next quarter day. And, and rather similarly, the lockdown happened on the, the 23rd of March and just before the March quarter day. And of course, we've had the June quarter day part as well. So what happens if your lease um, has a rent review effective on the March quarter day 2020 or the June quarter day 2020? Um, most most rent review provisions um, would have reference to market value, uh, which is essentially what a willing landlord would accept from a willing tenant or a willing tenant is willing to pay to a willing landlord. And you might wonder whether um, there would be payment or, or, or any value in any lease um, on the 25th of March or the 24th of June if you couldn't actually occupy uh, the premises for the purposes of running your business. So. I can see some, some disputes arising in relation to that. And, and similarly, in respect of dilapidations claims, if the leases come to an end during the period of lockdown, uh, then there may be arguments about uh, diminution in value, which is effectively the cap for dilapidations claims. So what's the value of a property in repair and out of repair? Uh, the difference between the two in respect of the repairing covenants represents the landlord's uh, statutory cap on what it may recover. Uh, but the valuing of that property uh, at those particular times when they couldn't be occupied, um, very difficult process. Um, and one that I've spoken to a few valuers about who are expressing uh, the same views as, as they did um, after the referendum. And that is, who knows what someone might pay for it. A property in that situation. So I, I can see that, that, that uh, those issues will, will become very um, prevalent over the next uh, six to 12 months. Thanks for that, Salim. Um, so, so, Michael, back to you. Against that backdrop of the disputes, which um, Salim has talked to us about, the reputational risks uh, on, on debt collectors that you identify, and I think also the reputational risks for some of the operators as well who, who are considering uh, a CVA or, or other restructuring, what practical steps can companies be taking uh, to, to protect themselves as far as possible um, against sort of adverse uh, media attention and publicity? Yeah, thanks, Emma. This is our, our bread and butter, really. So, I mean, you'd hope that the media would come uh, for comment, and they don't always come for comment. Sometimes you find out that something's been published, which you didn't know was going to be published. But normally, the media will try and get a comment because they will want to try and justify what they're publishing in the public interest ra rather than relying on any truth. There are a number of different defences that a publisher um, can use. So you would normally get an inquiry uh, and hopefully um, it, if you are concerned about your reputation uh, and adverse media, um, you may have prepared for, for, for that type of inquiry coming down the pipeline. And we've helped um, some clients, for example, in the cladding wow. space um, prepare Q&As uh, on, on the basis that they've been concerned about, about inquiries that the media might make. So they prepare in advance for the types of questions that might 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 come down the pipeline um uh, at which enables you to act quickly should an inquiry uh should an inquiry be made now now why do you need to act quickly act quickly well um it's because the media give very tight deadlines um it, for, for a response so normally you know if you're dealing with a normal commercial transaction you might have days or weeks to respond but um a media deadline can be you know, as little as a number of hours, uh, perhaps four hours, perhaps eight hours, perhaps you get an inquiry at 5 p.m. on a Friday for publication um, the following day or, 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 or at some other very, very inconvenient time. 
Um, so media deadlines can be very, very short, which means that you have little time to act um, uh, when you need to be doing so quickly and decisively. So preparing in advance is always um, our, our, our key message, but it's not always possible. If the deadline is very, very unreasonable, um, well then uh, lawyers or, or, or strong PR agents would usually push back on the deadline, try and ask for more time. Um, but, but let's assume that you're in the situation, you're in what, what we call a potential crisis situation. So you're a number of hours before publication of what could be a very damaging story. Um, what you'll need to do is engage with uh, the publisher, the journalist concerned, um, in order to try and stop the, the publication of what are potentially very false or defamatory allegations, or try and influence the content of that story and put your side across. Now, the reason for that is because um, common law, you cannot obtain an injunction uh, to stop a publisher publishing what could be defamatory allegations. It's it, it, almost impossible. It's possible in very, very, very limited circumstances, but that's just not an option. So um, it's publish and be damned. Um, so you need to uh, you need to do what you can prior to publication. So if the allegation is is false and defamatory, you need to be explaining to the publisher why that's the case uh, and explaining what the legal risks are of going through with that publication. So you'd be saying, well, look, if you publish that, that's going to cause serious harm to, to my business, uh, to, to, to our business, um, and that could expose you to a legal claim. Or alternatively, if it's inaccurate or misleading, but not necessarily defamatory, uh, and there is a kind of a very long technical uh, difference, which I won't bore anyone with at this point, but um, you, you want to be explaining why publishing something that's inaccurate or misleading could expose the publisher to a regulatory complaint. So that's a complaint to the press regulators uh, called IPSO. Um, so there are um, uh, buttons you can push prior to publication. What you're essentially doing is leveraging the risk of going through with something um, uh, rather rather than uh, taking legal action at that point, which, as I said, is, is, is not, not going to be effective. So um, if the allegation is not outright false or not inaccurate or misleading, your options are to try and balance the story up, perhaps by providing a statement uh, which is published in the article, putting aside your, your, your side of the story across, or perhaps briefing the publisher uh, on or off the record in order to try and get more positive content in there so that the, the story is less damaging overall to you. Um, so once the story is published, you'll want to obviously review what has been published. And if it's complete rubbish uh, and, and you need to, to take action, you might want to, for example, get the online version of the article amended. You might even have grounds to have the whole thing taken down. Um, and we, we have obviously dealt with a lot of instances where that's the preferred remedy. Um, but if you make a mistake, you may be entitled to a clarification or the publication of an apology. Um, you'll also be want, be, will be wanted to think about what other publishers might pick up. So they might pick up the story and they might try and republish the allegations. So you might want to put them on notice not to do that if very, very damaging and false allegations have been published. Um, but ultimately, if you can't resolve a situation with a, with a publisher and they have published something that's defamatory of your business or they've published something that's inaccurate or misleading, you may have to consider either a legal or, or a regulatory complaint. But I'd say 90% of the cases that we deal with, we are we are able to find um, a resolution without going down that expensive and potentially public route. Great, thanks so much for that, Michael. Um, I'm going to come to Claire in a, a moment, who hopefully is going to help us conclude on, on a slightly more positive note. Uh, but before I do that, just to uh, set the final polling question for today, uh, which is to what extent do you think coronavirus will give rise to a longer term shift away from the traditional full repairing and insuring lease? Uh, answers there, uh, I expect leases in all sectors to be affected and to share risks more evenly between the parties. Uh, B, I expect leases in some sectors to include pandemic clauses in the future, but that's it. Uh, and C, I'm not expecting any long-term changes. Um, and Claire, so coming to you on that topic, really, uh, do you think uh, coronavirus could give rise to, to potential for more 
creative asset management between uh, landlords uh, and their tenants, um, and, and a shift in the way that, that leases um, are drafted in, in the longer term. Thanks for that, Emma. Right, I'll try and find some good news. Um, it's not surprising that many landlords and tenants were already talking very openly between them uh, before the code was introduced, working to find meaningful ways through this crisis together. After all, it's in everyone's interest when the relationship is so symbiotic between landlord and tenant. Um, we've seen plenty of examples where rent concessions have been agreed by parties preferring the certainty to that end of moratorium cliff edge that we've talked about. Traditional quarterly rent payments um, may have become monthly to ease cash flows or were postponed to get altogether to be picked up at a later date in the year. Um, now, to be fair, a lot of those deals were born of those early days of the crisis. The UK lockdown was within days of that first March quarter date, and the only sensible plan for many was to pull up the drawbridge and stop spending. Um, lease term extensions were often negotiated in return for those immediate payment concessions. Um, now, though, it's apparent the virus isn't going anywhere fast. And it's possible to uh, look forward to see more creative ways where landlords and tenants can work together, not just to survive, but also to flourish. So here's my run through of top three trends that might help us find some good news at this time. Um, the first one is that traditional balance of risk um, in a lease. Now, as we all know, standard commercial leases in the UK are basically tried and tested investment vehicles um, for repairing and insuring the FRI leases provide landlords with a clear income stream akin to equity returns in the form of usually quarterly rental payments collected on top of the running costs involved in owning and managing and insuring the property itself. This may be about to change. With all the focus on how the virus removes the basis of business, the tenant business, especially in the retail sector. Back to Germany, retailers and investors were working together on a code of conduct that suggested a 50% rent reduction during closures was appropriate. Now, we're not there in the UK, but we are seeing people insert turnover rent provisions or think more about loss of business insurance products to try and readdress that balance. Um, parties in those vulnerable sectors like retail, they're already asking for extraordinary rental concessions agreed now to be repeated if or when the next pandemic emerges. Um, these COVID clauses might be time limited or require insurance options to back up or government support packages to be exhausted. Um, but it doesn't necessarily matter where that coronavirus um, hits uh, when the business continuity of a retailer depends on global supply chains. So often these can be quite complex to, um, to actually negotiate on a very individual basis. It's still very early on that basis to identify any new market standard drafting. But it does seem that the sharper edges of risk allocation are beginning to blur, um, particularly in sectors where business depends on footfall, and which is, of course, as we know, particularly vulnerable to lockdown. Um, the second major good news trend is possibly flexibility. We've heard much in recent years about how the provision and consumption of real estate is changing. And the demand for flexibility is really yapping at the heels of those lengthy FRI terms we've got used to and um, expecting and accepting. Tenants are looking forward for increasing flexibility on sharing space. Maybe they want to install concessions, particularly in the retail environment. Maybe they want to change use as their businesses adapt to challenges such as the coronavirus. The most forward thinking UK landlords are selling much more than square footage in any case. Armed with tech products, um, they're selling space as a service and they're working hard to build and maintain brand loyalty amongst their tenants. They're finding new income streams from the data they're collecting as a result. And now more than ever, the onus is on that landlord-tenant relationship flourishing as a kind of collaborative partnership. There's some good news, not um, some kind of medieval feudal model of uh, serf and overlord. Um, the third major trend, which we've been talking about for a long time now, is ESG. Picking up on Michael's points, be nice and consider reputational concerns. An increasing number of responsible landlords are making and thinking seriously about their ESG credentials. Industry benchmarks such as GRESP um, and a growth in green leases, green loans, means there's now a very tangible value on sustainability. And ESG is much more than a buzzword. Um, these businesses are genuinely committed to improving the environmental credentials of their portfolios. And meanwhile, we do have the next MEES deadline fast approaching in the UK. As of the 1st of April 2023, landlords face fines for continuing to let properties with substandard ratings. That's currently F or G, but is likely to go up. 
And anticipating this, many could start to use the COVID concession proactively. Many landlords could trade it for the kind of lease amendments they need to properly future-proof their assets. They might want to control production of EPCs in a building, or they might want to reserve new rights to retrofit the kit that increases sustainability and improves their ratings, um, improves their investment ratings, and decreases running costs. And in that way, it can sort of be a win-win. That's great. Thanks, Claire. So again, I'm going to turn to the audience to see uh, what their thoughts are on this point. Um, so majority, 60% left for option B uh, is the inclusion of pandemic clauses. 27% uh, think there might be a more wholesale shift uh, in, in the way that leases um, are negotiated and drafted. And then 12% don't expect any long-term changes. Um, so it'll be really interesting uh, over the next few months and into the longer term to see how that plays out. Um, I'm conscious that we're almost at the hour and I'm sure people need to, to grab a drink before uh, their 10 o'clock meetings and calls. Um, so I'm just going to say thank you to the speakers today, Salim, Claire, Amy, Michael, uh, for your time. Uh, conscious that we do have a few questions that we uh, haven't picked up. Um, so we will uh, come back to those um, after the presentation today. So please be sure questions will be responded to and, and apologies we've run out of time for them now. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining. If there's any further questions that you'd like to ask any of the team here, uh, then please do get in touch. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you.